Okay, so first of all, thank you all for coming. This is my first FOSDEM. I am uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I am a bit overwhelmed with the size of this event and by the fact that uh, all of you people are so engaged with what people have to say and that there are no lunch breaks and you are still here in this room, so thanks. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, let's talk about debugging. This is what we're going to talk about today and I'm going to talk about something that's really going to change our community. Now, let's start with a few questions. With a raise of hand, how many people here use, how many people here develop uh, front-end applications? Okay, very good. How many people still use alert as the main way to debug their application? Okay, okay. I like you, I like. Um, how many people use console log as the main way? Okay, and, and how many use a, a some browser's debugger? And the last one, how many use Mozilla's debugger, Firefox? Okay, so I feel like, is there anyone who has not raised their hand at all? <laughs> okay. Uh, do you develop apps, <laughs> sir? <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, yeah, debugging, uh, so debugging is indeed, it's hard. Uh, there are a few ways to do it, um, and I think a lot of deb developers, as seen by the raise of your hands today, don't resort to the debugger as the first way to debug the application. And I put this responsibility more on the debuggers than the developers, because we are users. We will use whatever tool makes uh, us most productive. So, like, how many times did this happen to you? that you are debugging and your code is somewhere between the start and the end of the call stack and all the rest is just uh, other people's code. It's frameworks. Or uh, you have your code, you're trying to debug your application production. You have this uh, variable called user. You're trying to um, debug it and eval evaluate what the value is, but it's impossible because the code is obfuscated. It's actually E. So, did this happen to you? No? Well, sometimes. Um, okay, so how would you like to have the power to change this behavior in the debugger? Well, in Firefox DevTools team, they would like you to have this power, and it's like the ideal uh, scenario today because you've just had one hour. H how many people here attended last two sessions about the by uh, Julian and Nico, Nicola. Okay, so, so for you it's, it's great. I already have the context of what's going on in the debugger. Uh, but today I'm going to give you the context about how Firefox is giving you the power to shape your own JavaScript debugger. So about me, my name is Amit. I'm a front-end consultant from Israel. I'm also a Mozilla tech speaker. Uh, you can find me on uh, GitHub. I sometimes write on Medium and I tweet. Uh, with all with the same handle. Um, what I do in my day-to-day -day job is I help organizations um, scale consistently with their, their UI and up their UI games by uh, bringing, building out design systems and atomic design. So enough about me. Let's talk about your JavaScript in 2017, or sorry, in 2018. Oh my God, the slide is totally out of, uh, out of sync. So, the first thing is it's probably framework driven. You're probably using a lot of third party code in your application and your code is a portion of this application. Now, if you write some, um, some ES6 code, you're probably transpiling that to ES5 just because you're running it in all the browsers or you're writing TypeScript. So you trans let's say you're transpiling your code. Um, also, you're probably bundling your code if you like to be on the edge because you're writing dozens of source files and you want to save bandwidth and not send out so many requests, so you're bundling your code. And also, you're a super, uh, super developer who knows that they don't want uh, all their code to be exposed on the client side, even though it's not real security, but you like to minify and obfuscate and uglify your code and that's the best practices for today. So I'm going to cover these points, but also if you're doing other things than just mapping arrays, then you probably have some asynchronous code. You're fetching data from a server or you're uh, handling user interactions 
And finally, you might be running your JavaScript in other things than a browser, uh, a laptop's browser. You might be running it, them on a, uh, on a controller. You might be running them on your refrigerator or a security camera. So uh, to debug JavaScript applications means you have also to address these points. Comes in debugger.html project which is a new and shiny project out of the Mozilla Firefox DevTools team. Now, they set out to address all the points that I depicted uh, earlier. And they are now rebuilding the entire DevTools suite from scratch using modern web technologies. So the debugger project has been going on for about two years now. And it's using React, Redux, Webpack, and Babel, and more community-powered tools to build, uh, to move forward the debugger. And this project was named debugger.html because it's just a simple, plain HTML, JavaScript, CSS implementation of a debugger's front end. So there's no more Zool for whoever knows and have experienced the pains. And it's, uh, it's a simple web application. So let's see how the debugger in 2018 solves the problems that we have, uh, that I, or the, the behavior of your modern JavaScript. So if you have this spring driven and uh, remember this scenario, so let's see how we can address this. So first of all, I just want to show how you install the debugger. Uh, the scenario is pretty simple. You start by, so I'm going to debug a to-do app. It's totally cool. Uh, um, on the, on the edge. Um, so at the beginning, you start by git cloning the repository. Then you run uh, yarn to get all the sources. And yarn starts, opens up, and fires a Webpack dev server on port 8000. So you can go now to your browser and start localhost port 8000 to see the web app of the debugger. Now, what do you actually see when you open up uh, another tab, uh, local, localhost 8000, is not the debugger. It's something that we call the launch pad. And the launch pad is what you see when you launch the debugger, but outside of Firefox as a web application. So if it's inside the DevTools, uh, like bundled in your browser, you won't see this. But in order to be able to debug different uh, tabs, you see this launch pad, which allows you to select the tab that you want to debug. So I have this backbone to-do app, and I'm going to select it and start uh, debugging it. So I choose this tab, and then I see the debugger. I have a neat uh, to-do list, uh, make vanilla pudding, put in a mayo jar, and eat in public. And now I'm going to set a breakpoint, and I'm, I'm going to break on this, uh, on this line. And I see that in the, in the call stack, there is a place where the backbone uh, library is shown with its logo. And it's also collapsing and expanding the, the stack frame. So it's really nice. The, the whole stack frame is visualized in a collapsed way so I can identify why, where my sources are and what third parties I'm using. And there are a lot of, a lot of libraries um, and third-party tools that are ad addressed and have these logos. So I saw this, and I thought that it could use some, some love. And <clears throat> so when you expand collapse these, these frames, you don't really know how many frames are, are collapsed. So I just figured out, you know, it's really nice to have this, this number next to the collapsed stack frame. Um, so I added this, and my PR was accepted. And I just want to show you how easy it is, because all it means is, yeah, it's a bit hard to see with the, with the sliding, but the whole thing is a React component. I wrote like a badge component that is a circle with a number. And I already have this number. It's the length of the, of the, of the group of stack frames. So, so it was really easy for me to add this feature, and it was accepted. So the next thing is transpilation. And uh, here, I just want to show you. So this was appearing in previous talks here. But we do, as an example, syntax highlighting, for example, JSX. Um, and the way uh, it's done is 
the debugger is using code mirror for its uh, for for its settings. So you just say you know set the mode to JSX if you recognize that this is a JSX file or it's a React component. Alas, it's not perfect. So Julian, who's uh, right here in the crowd and spoke before me, opened up a ticket uh, some time ago about this not working uh, as planned, and w one of the contributors. Um, and you can see that this uh, didn't work properly. And one computer claimed this issue. So what I want to demonstrate here is how nice it is that you can go to GitHub and just comment with slash claim. And there's a little GitHub uh, bot that is answering with thank you for claiming this issue. And here are some uh, setup, getting set up con and contributing developing uh, manuals that you and we'll, we'll be happy to answer your questions in Slack and you can always feel free to unclaim it if you don't get time or get busy. So th the debugger team. Um, so the next thing is your bundled code. Also not much to show here but I just wanted to, to show like there's it's the little things. Um, a lot of people bundle their code via Webpack. So if it's bundled via Webpack, you get the nice little uh, Webpack logo right there. So j just to reduce the cognitive load, if you spot that icon, you know, where's the, where the web Webpack folder is. OK. And lastly, obfuscated code. That's, that's a bit of a problem to debug obfuscated code. Um, so like on the left, on your left, is, uh, is obfuscated code, but when you debug it, you would really like to debug the code that you originally wrote, not the generated one. So I want to tell you a story about mapped expressions, which is a personal story with, that I was involved in. Um, so some time ago, Jason Laster, who's uh, one of the, the developers of the debugger, um, wrote this tweet, debugger aficionados will love this uh, PR by Yuri Delnik how uh, the debugger can now map minified variable names onto original variables. Um, this means scopes and preview look great. And uh, next up is what, oops. Next up is the watch expressions. Uh, this feature touches AST, source maps, and JS scopes. What's not to love? Stop by if you're intrigued. And needless to say, I was intrigued. Uh, so let's just see a visualization of the problem. So you have this to-do app again, and you buy a parrot. You teach the parrot to say, help, I've been turned into a parrot. Um, I'm going to debug this, and I'm, so I'm adding a to-do. I'm adding a breakpoint where I'm adding a to-do, and let's enlarge this for a second, and now I'm pausing the breakpoint, and I can see that action is properly evaluated when I hover over it, but and in the scopes, it's also properly evaluated. I can see the values of action.txt, action.type. However, when I evaluate the, the express expression in the watch expressions, action is unavailable. And if I write t there, then it does get evaluated properly. So what happens here is the actual front end of the debugger is going over to the back end, which is the, which is the Firefox web application and says, you know, hey, can you evaluate action for me? And the Firefox uh, received this message and says, you know, hey, sir, there's someone here trying to evaluate action I can't find anywhere. And, uh, and then uh, tell them we don't have it. And then the front end says, you know, oh, shit, I'm, I'm sorry, you're right, it's T, my bad. And then Firefox says, okay, T, it's, T is cool, and everyone's happy. And the code that is responsible for this mishap is in a function called evaluate expression, which receives an, expre an expression and just takes the input that the user wrote and sends that out to, the, to Firefox. And that is, of course, not good because we're sending action, which is bad. We want to send T. So, um, so yeah, this is a problem. And the way to solve it is just to add a snippet between that, uh, you know, I get the input and before I send it out, I just do a little thing that changes action to T, and then I send it over. So, so cool stuff in the middle, and let's just see this in action so that you believe me and we're all on the same page and I have your credibility. 
so another to do, you sneeze in front of the Pope, get blessed. Now I want, really want to add a to do that says stop telling jokes and I'm paused on this break point and now I'm evaluating action gets evaluated properly. Yay, it worked unexpectedly. I can also though evaluate other things. I can write action.text, I can write action.type, I can concatenate strings so I can say, you know, don't plus action.text. Let's just wait for the guy or the girl to type this. And I can also do sort of cra crazy things. I, I can evaluate everything. And you must remember, this is the original source. It's not the generated one. It's not the bundled, obfuscated, uglified one. So I pasted it, this in, a very, very complicated expression gets, and gets evaluated properly. So the task at hand is to replace action with T in all these types of expressions. Now, if it was only I want to evaluate action, that would be easy. I replace action with T. But as it comes to action.text, I need to transform it to T.text. A little bit trickier. I might think of a solution, maybe a regular expression to exchange. But what happens with like this string concatenation? Or what happens with this very complex uh, expression? So here, the solution for us is using the mighty Babel. And the Babel gives us the ability to build out an AST. So with a raise of hand, who here knows what AST stands for? OK, great. So it stands for abstract syntax tree, which means a representation of a data structure of our code. So let's just very briefly look at the AST for this type, for this expression. This expression is an expression statement. Um, it has uh, 22 characters, starts at 0 and at 21. Um, the expression property is a binary expression, starts at 0 and at 21, there's an operator of plus, has two children, the left one is a literal, it's the don't, has, uh, starts at 0 and at 7. The right one is a member expression, action.text, uh, starts at 0 and at 21. The member expression is also divided into two uh, two properties, the object, which is the identifier action, and the property, which is the identifier text. Okay, so this is the AST for this expression. Now, once I have the AST for this expression, I can run this code, which will help me do the switch. So, I take this expression, and I use Babel to parse it. I parse it into the AST that I've just shown you. Now, I traverse this AST with all these binary expression, member expression, object literals, and blah, blah, blah. And when I find out, find an identifier that its name is action, then I take that one, I go to my bindings, and this related to the tweet that I showed you earlier about all the infrastructure work already done, which the infrastructure work means we know how to map action to T. So I find this, this identifier action, I replace it with T, and what I d just need to do now is generate a new abstract syntax, uh, generate a new expression out of my modified uh, uh, syntax tree. So then we have don't plus T dot text. How nice is that? <laughs> Come on. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so we're all good geeks here. We enjoy our little mind game. So let me just very briefly do a, a small thing. If you can run a debugger as a web application, then you can debug your debugger as a web application. And you can debug that debugger as a web application as well. So what I'm going to do now is I have this to-do app. How do you convert this uh, JavaScript bug? I opened a debugger called D1. And then I opened a debugger called D2 which is showing me the sources for, the, for D1. Now I have D3, I like to call D3, um, which is showing me the sources for D2. And I'm just, due to the lack of space, I'm just gonna op open D4 and that's it. Uh, that's showing the sources and ability to debug D3. And we're, what we're gonna have now is a little, uh, is a little pause party. 
the nicest place to pause on a breakpoint when you're debugging a debugger is the, when it's pausing, because then all the information comes to life. You see both the sources and the, and the stack frames and everything. So let's start. How do you configure the JavaScript bug? You console it. Now we're, we're part on D4, and I can see all the stack frames, and these frames relate to the frames that D3 is paused on. So I'm going to play that, and D3 suddenly comes to life. And I place just the same uh, place, uh, breakpoint in the same place, and I'm starting to, I see D2 com become t coming to life, and then I step over and I can see that the expression is not well evaluated. Um, but when I, that's because I didn't run the code to evaluate the expression, but when I, I'll do it now, I will see the, evalu the expression get evaluated here on D1. And now I'm going to play D1 and the web application resumes. So it's really neat to be able to, to write code in a debugger. So main message here is just don't be afraid to dip your toe. I started with uh, just pull requests that have CSS changes. And little by little, I start to understand more and more the code, which br brings me to you, the community. So if the community is, does, does the work, the community gets to decide what features go in. And this is 100% true for Firefox and specifically for the debugger. And anyone can help whether it be styling or code contribution or performance optimizations and profiling or uh, writing tests and documentation or doing design work. A anything is possible, anything is needed. And this is a first class open source project. Um, and they're, they're pushing very hard for community in engagement. Um, and I think it's, very, it's monumental because it means that individual contributors have the, now can like they can tr contribute by reusing the the knowledge that they get at their workplace or at home um, and apply it in the debugger. So, but more importantly, it works both ways because if you're a React developer at work and you contribute to the debugger, you also get value from contributing because you're getting knowledge and experience from the from working with the team of experts that's working on the debugger. So you get, you get your contribution from giving your com contribution, which is great. And I think it's also monumental because this is the first time I, that I know about that a browser, a platform, is using community-powered tools to develop its own. So this is, really, uh, this is really nice. And there are many ways that you can engage in this project. So the first one is by uh, using Slack. There's a Slack channel. Uh, second one is on GitHub. It's no more uh, Bugzilla, no more Mer Mercurial. It's all developed in the modern workflow that we know today. Uh, there are weekly updates because the nature of open source projects is you open up your laptop to work on it, and then you finish the, your work. You forget about it for maybe a week or two or three, and you want to come back to the project, understand what has happened. So you get these weekly updates. You can read out what people have done. There's a lot of documentation. And there are weekly calls where it's on video. And you can see the team and see other contributors and sort of relax because during the intense work of coding and code reviews online, you can like just hop in on a call, no judgment, no criticism, and just hang out and chat a little bit with the team and get, get to understand what's going on. So it make it, makes it a lot more personal. Now, I want to share with you a way that I got people hooked in Israel about, the, about this project, amongst others, and we call it the Goodness Squad. So this, this is something that I organized in Israel uh, for a little over a year now, and it's a monthly hacking event. And the nice thing about it is the format. We organize for each event, uh, we prepare a few projects. So I bring, in addition to organizing the event, I bring the debugger, and other people bring in their own their projects or you know other big company projects or or individual pro projects and they are the mentors of these projects so 
if 10, between 10 and 50 people come to the, to the event, uh, they choose the project that they want to work on, and the mentor is, in, is responsible to get those people into open source contribution. So that means technically understanding how to work with forks and pull requests, if people are not uh, familiar, but also just to know the people behind the project and get to understand the conventions and the code and the processes makes it a lot more accessible to contribute to open source. And a lot of people um, uh, find this a barrier that we are trying to, to take down. And the focus is to bring issues to the event, event in a way that it's bite-sized. So by the end of every event, everyone should be able to do a pull request. And it's very exciting to see people get excited uh, because by 9, 9 p.m. they have been able, they have worked for three hours and saw uh, and and contributed to an actual open source project. So, what's next? Um, I want to just say, you know, what I would like to do like in, in 2018 in the debugger, I want to develop a feature that is sort of, I call it the debug trails, because how many times did it happen to you that um, you want to pause at a very specific place in an execution path, but you set a breakpoint somewhere, but on the first time you don't want, you want uh, like a second iteration of it, or you need to like, you pause it, and then you step into, step out, step over, step into, you go to different sources, you put breakpoints, you take down breakpoints until you get to the state that you want. You look at the state, you evaluate, and you uh, try to understand what's going on in your program, and then you understand, then you do the whole thing again. So I want to try to understand if it's possible to model out this, this trail and say, you know, whether, whether it be manual or automatic that I, I learn what the, what the developer wanted to, where the developer wanted to pause, but be able to define a trail in the execution path and pause on that automatically. So the question is, what is your thought about contributing to, to the debugger in 2018? What are the things that you find uh, problematic in, in debugging JavaScript or Rust or anything else. Um, and if you do find it, come and hack with us. Merci beaucoup and bedank. Thank you, questions. So, no time for questions, but feel free to grab me here, outside, wherever. <laughs>